Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Customers Bank, Ariel Property Advisors, Capital One Bank, Sterling National Bank, Marks Panath LLP, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, B6 Real Estate Advisors, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, RPW Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Maringor Family Foundation, and these friends. There's one name in New York that permeates a great history, a great family, and a great human being. That's our 51st governor of the state of New York, Hugh Carey. Seven-term congressman Hugh Carey from Brooklyn. And that's why I have his two sons over here to tell the story about the Carey family and their lives. So today, on a two-part Building in New York, I have Michael Carey. And I have the oldest brother, Christopher Carey, to tell the story of the Carey family. So tell me about Grandpa. Dada? Dada. Our, uh, our father's father? Right. Well, Dada was uh, an entrepreneur. In when the, did he come over? He was born here. His father was born on the other side, but Dada, Dada was born here. In tell Brooklyn. me about Dada's father. Red Mike? Red Mike. Red Mike uh, was a... Uh, 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 easy. Yep. He was a hod carrier and a laborer and uh, uh, the head of the family, but uh, he was a bit rambunctious. When did he come over? He came over, I want to say, in the uh, 1880s, 1880s. Famine. came through the Battery, not through Ellis Island. And uh, he got work on projects like the Brooklyn Fox Building, building downtown Brooklyn, what is now where Metro Tech is. Those, those, those buildings at the time. Uh, but uh, he was, uh, I was about to say, he was kind of rambunctious, uh, given to a little more than uh, uh, altar wine in terms of spirits, uh, but a very colorful uh, character. So that was Dada's father. father. Right. Okay, so tell me about Dada. Dada was very entrepreneurial. He was in the uh, home fuel oil business, starting with kerosene. He would deliver kerosene, then eventually was able to uh, uh, move into petroleum and had various accounts throughout the uh, metropolitan uh, area. Uh, bought up little properties around the Navy Yard, uh, East New York, that type of thing. Had a very good job with, with, with Sinclair. But then standard, standard. Standard oil. Uh, but that, that job was eliminated, so he was back on his own. So he would travel all the way out to the east end of Long Island for accounts, come all the way back. In and, the petroleum and, truck. In, in, in the truck with the cans, right? The, yeah, with the cans and deliver. He, he built up that business through the Depression. Uh, our father would talk about times there would be creditors uh, coming to pick up what they were owed, and he was trying to get the receipts collecting from the, his accounts. Uh, they play games in the backyard of the house in Brooklyn, throwing the ball over the uh, fence. That meant you go over the fence because the bill collector was coming through the front door and you get out the back door. 
So, but now, he always, he always though, met his obligations. He, he kept the business afloat and uh, taught my, our father a great lesson about the honor. And now, how many brothers and sisters did Dad have? Dad had one sister. And Ann Dwyer. But uh, the, the, the family, uh, our grandparents were, were Dada and we had Mama, Margaret okay. Collins Carey. So tell me about Mama and how her family came to America. Same thing, you know, around the They were from, uh, from uh, Galway, uh, the, yeah. the, as she was a Collins. The Careys were from Tyrone, a uh, little, little area called Tome. Margaret came and uh, she was industrious. She got a job as an office manager, and her office was 17. This is your grandmother. Our grandmother, 17 Battery Place, uh, and she went to work for the uh, for a barrel company, a barrel company that was owned by the world famous Nellie Bly. And but the uh, the the barrels were used for petroleum products, so that's how uh, Dennis Carey, Dada, met Margaret. So that's. So how did Dennis Carey meet Mar? Through the, the petroleum business, the, the barrels, uh, the steel barrel company that uh, was owned by Nellie Bly, Margaret was running that business. So Dennis Carey needed to get some steel barrels to move either petroleum or petroleum byproducts uh, to accounts. So that, that, uh, that's how they met. So how, how did the family live in Brooklyn? Well, they had they had uh, what is now Lower Park Slope. That was uh, the St. Augustine's Parish in Brooklyn, below Fifth Avenue, and what are now brownstones for multifamilies. They have, they have about four different families, all related, under one roof, and that's where uh, the Carey boys grew up in the shadow of St. Augustine's. They were all altar boys and. Dennis Carey, the father, went to work, and Margaret took care of the boys. She still kept part-time interest in her job. So talk to me about your father, when he was born, and his brothers and other siblings. Well, there were, there were six boys, Ed, Dennis Jr., Hugh, uh, John, Edward, and Jerry. Ma Martin and Jerry. Martin and Jerry, I'm sorry. And where they lived? So he was the third. And I where think they lived? In Park Place? They lived in Park Place. Park Place. Right across Brooklyn. the street from the church. And they were, I think, um, if not all, most of them attended St. Augustine's Catholic School. They all went to St. Augustine's Grammar School. They went to different high schools. Different high schools. And where did your father, where was he in the pecking order? He was the third from the oldest. So he had Ed and Dennis, his two older brothers. Right, and Ed and Dennis later on go into the petroleum business? Into the business. oil business, correct. correct. Separately, but, but ultimately together. Okay. But they were very driven. They were all very competitive. They were all very good students. They had a very, very tough, uh, uh, steely, as Chris said, uh, Margaret Collins worked for Nellie Bly, so she was an early on sort of woman's, um, woman's achiever. Uh, and uh, Nellie Bly was a very su successful woman. She was very much a force behind uh, our grandfather's success, if you will, you know, pushing him to be successful, pushing him to work hard. Uh, the boys were all very, very good students, made to be by, the, by their mother, who was you know, a stern taskmaster. She had high standards. She drove them to be successful. They all excelled in school. Uh, they were all ambitious. Um, I think they were, grew up at a time where Irish were, need not apply, that sort of thing. So, so, so they felt like they had to work harder to achieve things, which they all, they all did. The two older brothers ultimately wound up in the oil business. And I think my father, who went to law school at St. John's after he went to the war, I think at first was in the family business, but I think never really wanted to be an understudy to, to the two older brothers, both of whom, as I said, were, were, were tough guys. And, um, and I think he just needed to break out on his own. Now, you, um, we mentioned about the same St. Augustus. They were all and, altar boys there. As we said, they all went to that grammar school. And they had a very special mentor, Sister Mary Morris. It took a particular interest, uh, especially in Hugh Carey the third. She knew, or she felt early on, that he had a, a special gift for, for a career. Isn't there a great story about how your father met his wife at the age of 13? This she was 13. She was 13. She was Tell 13. the story about that. Well, program. St. Augustine's was, was their parish. Uh, and then my, uh, our father went to the high school. And he was uh, uh, a senior. And 
got invited to a tea dance. That's what you went to, tea dance. And uh, uh, our mother was a uh, freshman at uh, oh. St. Angela Hall. So they met and had a nice, and she, he was a big shot senior. She's a uh, nice, very pretty uh, uh, only child um, uh, freshman at the time. And they really didn't know each other too much after that until the intervention of the war and then when our father right, returned Right, but I, I think the in the folklore or the, or the article I read, she, your, your father either kisses her at this event, okay, and he doesn't see her for many years after. They, they My father was a showman. He was okay? also. And so at I the, think he, was, he had a little bit of flair for the dramatic. So I. He was think also he at the time he had he had enlisted in the cavalry. Right. He so, was in the National Guard originally. The he, National Guard had a, it had the 101st uh, Cavalry. So he and a couple of his very close friends joined up, yep. and they they were uh, they they worked out of the Bedford Avenue Armory, and they had maneuvers out in Huntington, Long Island. So he had a very dashing outfit and uh, uh, high lace boots and uh, cut cut quite the figure. Yeah, I so think, he was a big man. At, I think he, the know. cavalry with horses. Oh yeah, yes. with the horses. Yeah, sure. Yes, he had this notion of going and riding, like uh, Gary Cooper, riding off into the <laughs> sunset. Then they said, uh, "Guess what? You're going out to uh, Colorado to get into the cavalry." So when but he we, went home and told his mother that, she was none too happy. But in the meantime, I think what may have happened, he may have. He may have either given Helen Owen Carey, our mother, a, a peck on the cheek or a blue or a kiss or something like that just to... Right, but they don't see each other for many years. No, not That's at all. correct. No, no, in so fact, he she was, got married in the meantime. Yeah. He was in the cavalry. The war broke out. The National Guard units were all... Everyone was federalized. Uh, one friend went into the Navy, and our father uh, uh, was uh, went into the infantry, sent out to Colorado. They sent him to... Uh, OCS, and uh, he, short, in short order, became an officer with the 104th uh, Timberwolf Division under uh, Terry Allen, and they were mainly draftees. They were training draftees while the more experienced soldiers were had already shipped out and overseas. And he won a number of medals during the war. Yep, he got a bronze star. He got the Croix de Guerre from the French government. Uh, I think and he wore the, the combat infantry yep, badge. Yep, he was, yep. his, his unit was in two hundred eighty-five uh, straight days of combat. Yep. And he was the first um, American officer into the Nordhausen concentration camp. So he saw firsthand the vestiges. Of Which is subsequently one of the reasons because of the death penalty, right? There is, there is the linkage there because I think later on in life he was honored by the Justice Project, which tries to... Um, make sure that uh, people who are charged with crimes that have capital punishment as a potential penalty, you know, get a fair trial and fair hearing. And he was always against the death penalty. And as he told us then, we didn't know it at the time because he really didn't share his war experiences as, as many did not from that era. Uh, they sort of privatized or internalized it. But he told us that so when, he, when he received the award, he told the assembled group that once he saw what had happened in the concentration camps, he, he's, he sort of knew intuitively and vowed that if he ever had any say to it, that the government would not have the right of life and death over, over people because he thought that was just ultimately that, that's, that was the worst example of, of how government could, could treat people. So he, he finishes the war as a lieutenant colonel, correct? Yes. And then when he comes back, he gets a full bird colonel, correct? He, when, when he went to Congress. He had continued uh, active participation in the National Guard, but as a congressman, that uh, uh, entitled him to full bird status. So he was uh, in the reserves after he completes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's 1945, he comes back. Hey, had he had gone to St. John's at this time? Had he completed law school? No. Or he just no. came no. back no. in 1945? By the time Hugh L. Carey graduated from law school, he had five children. Let's get before the five. Very children. fervent period. Uh, I realize it. <laughs> okay, so what happens when he gets back and reacquaints himself with your mother? Well, go he goes to work uh, uh, a little bit in the family business, but he's also interested in uh, you know as a uh, a young veteran to get involved. So he joins and he was a leader in the New York State Young Democrats, and worked at the uh, at the Biltmore Hotel where they're. They had an office, was doing work, and 
that was part of his vision for his career. Uh, they did reward him with a possible position, patronage. They told him to go to an address on Willoughby Street. He went over and it was the office of truancy. <laughs> so he turned that job down. He wasn't going to go around. Be a true north. Right, right. Grabbing kids were playing hooky. So, so he had to put that on hold uh, for a while. But he was getting his law degree at the time and um, uh, also started to work in the, in the family business, Peerless uh, uh, Petrick uh, Oil and Chemical. While he was working at the Biltmore, uh, he arranged through a friend to meet Helen Carey, who they hadn't seen since before the war, uh, at the clock under the clock at the wait. Bill. Wait, if I may interject, he he, as part of his burgeoning um, interest in in politics and in government, Eleanor Roosevelt was speaking at the Biltmore. So so as part of this, going to see Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, uh, I guess a mutual friend had um, had arranged for Helen Owen Carey to also to be there. They had probably not seen each other in years, yeah. but the moment they saw each other, they remembered that moment when, as you, as you referenced before, there was that pseudo kiss or on the cheek or, or you know, um, uh, hello, goodbye. Distractive woman. Distractive right. woman who he always considered his, his Judy Garland. That's who, that's who he referred to her as. He was, he was, he was mad about it. He was her. smitten. Smitten, exactly. And so they, they meet again under the clock Turns out that my mother had been re had married, but her husband tragically had died in a, in a freak accident. It was an incident in the Navy. Very bright. I mean, went Regis High School in Columbia, uh, but he was in the Navy, and a magazine exploded, and unfortunately, sh shrapnel caught him in the jugular vein. So he died. She left uh, our mother, who was uh, already expecting right. uh, our uh, our sister Randy. So Alexandria. When, so when. Hugh and Helen meet under the under the clock. She had a little girl at home. So when does Dad get married to Helen? They got married in February of 1947. So it's February of 1947, and Dad's working at the petroleum company and also at and he's going to law school. Going to law school, school at St. John's. Right. Right. They don't have a place to live. Dad had found a little bungalow in Long Beach, on uh, on Pine Street. So uh, the family. Uh, which at that time included uh, our father and mother and Randy lived in that bungalow. Uh, and then I was born. Once the summer came, there was Randy, now a baby, and a little dog, Rompy, my parents. And our grandparents came out, and then it was just too much. <laughs> we couldn't fit everybody. So what happens next? So our father found a house in the Brooklyn College area of Flatbush. Uh, uh, East 22nd between Farragut and Glenwood, around the corner from Our Lady of Refuge. 715. 715 East 22nd Street. So we moved to the parish of, of uh, Our Lady of Refuge, which was a wonderful parish. The boys were all altar boys. There was only one problem with the parish. They didn't have any school. So as we grew up, we had to go from Farragut Road all the way down to Avenue O to St. Brendan's. So we, we were Irish uh, Catholic bus. We would bust down to another. Busing, busing. Busing to another name. So they, bu they bust. You were bust. We were bust to a Catholic school. So. so how does Dad decide to get involved with politics? Honestly, I think it was something that, that tested within him that he wanted to do something separate and apart from his very, um, if you will, uh, dominant, controlling older brothers. Was Dad uh, in favor of this? Well, I don't think Dad had much to say, but I think it was just my father wanting to do something different on his own. I but, think he got an opportunity, um, and I think it was almost like a sacrificial lamb to go up against a well-established uh, Republican by the name of Francis or Frank Dorn in the 12th Congressional District. What year was this? 1960. 1960. So as part of his efforts with young Democrats and that sort of thing. In 1960, he's about 48. So as Mike was saying, a young Democrat, he, his story was that he got a mailing about supporting Frank Dorn, who was a Republican. He knew Frank Dorn. Frank Dorn was about four years ahead of him at St. St. Augustine's. He was part of that generation of young veterans, mm -hmm. uh, and this was the year that John F. Kennedy was, was running. So the figure, the timing was good. So he went to see the, the leaders of the Brooklyn Democratic Party, 
and told him what he wanted to do. And he said, well, that's fine. Go ahead, run. But we're not going to give you any money or support you. So he, he started his own campaign, opened up a little storefront uh, on Flatbush Avenue, and started campaigning all over the district. And everybody in the family got involved, and, uh, including our mother, very much so. Uh, came I up mean, with, you were 13 at that time. In we weren't 13. We were maybe about uh, 11, 8. You lose track. But uh, we all got involved in, in the campaign. He came up with a brilliant mailer postcard, showed the family. The first one was um, outside the Brooklyn Library at Grand Army Plaza. Mm -hmm. And it was taken. Our mother was in the hospital. She had just delivered a baby. They had to superimpose our mother mm -hmm. and father's picture. But then, so uh, he ran independent of the Democratic organization. And it was a very unusual district. It had, in Flatbush, you had moderate Democrat. Uh, then you had Jewish areas, moderate, moderate Irish Catholic Democratic Jewish areas. And then it snaked out through uh, uh, to Bay Ridge, which was a very conservative area. So you had to campaign all over these areas. Uh, and but in the Kennedy came to Brooklyn once. We met him uh, in front of the Marine Theater on Flatbush Avenue. Uh, he won, he won by 1,285 votes, I believe, was the plurality of the first uh, uh, first election. Gets elected. There was a Republican-controlled legislature under Rockefeller. They reapportioned. They called it gerrymandered district, we found our house in Flatbush wasn't even in the district, which caused us uh, to move. To relocate. Yeah, relocate. But it was a great move because our father found a wonderful house for us uh, at uh, 61 Prospect Park West, uh, 2nd Street, right on the corner. And uh, then he went on. He was reelected. Second time was a tough win. But this was in the new district, which, which is even more conservative. He won by 280 votes. Now he also had four the, recounts. Used the postcards again, right? Yeah. Used the postcards for, right. for every, ele every congressional of the election. Postcard. Yeah. So every congressional election, he used the postcards. Yes. Right. And especially in the first few, there'd be more, more children added to it. So the last few, there was the same number. But people would love them because they, you'd see the family grow. So. Yeah. I mean, the family grew to subsequently 12, correct? 14. 14. 14, 14. 14 right. People would say, we got to elect this guy. Somebody's got to feed all these kids. <laughs> so it became somewhat of a great lore, L-O-R-E. So when does Dad decide that he wants to become the governor? Well, I think, I think he, he, there's a lot of things in between. Right. Um, I think he becomes uh, very much um, a leader in, in the caucus from New York. I think he becomes a protege of one uh, Manny Seller who was the famed uh, chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, I think ultimately he was on the Ways and Means Committee under um, Wilbur Mills, which is one of the more powerful in the, uh, in the House. So I think slowly but steadily, he, he grew up in the ranks of the House leadership, um, served under um, Sam Rayburn and others, other great, you know, sort of Democratic congressional uh, leaders. Um, Hale Boggs was a mentor of my father, Louisiana. He died in a plane accident in, um, uh, I want to say, 70, 70, 72. I think that changed the leadership um, growth path for my father because I think at that point, Tip O'Neill became the guy that was likely to, to move up into the speakership and so forth. So my father's options for moving up within the House were somewhat limited. I think at, at, at about the same time, he was thinking about running for the, for the mayor of the city of New York that was in 1969. That was a, 69. And, he actually and, had his own ticket yeah. for a brief time. Beam with Wagner Carey Thaler, and he was going to run okay, against but Lindsay. But he, he actually had it for a few weeks. It was Carey Lowe and Lorena. Right. So uh, he was going to run for mayor. Against he was, Lindsay. Yeah, against Lindsay. Uh, but then Bob Wagner got back into the picture. So then Wagner took the top spot. Right, correct. And then uh, it was Wagner Carey Thaler. So our father was on the ticket for the primary. Uh, for city council president. And they, Wagner and my father had been very good friends. So when Wagner came in, my father sort of deferred to, the, to Wagner, who had previously been mayor and a friend and a supporter. And so he sort of stepped aside in favor of that, joined that ticket. Unfortunately, Wagner did not win, though. That was Wagner the, didn't win. Kerry ran ahead 
of the ticket. And O'Connor, I think, was yeah, the, I think uh, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, they, they could have been a recount. It was that close. Unfortunately, July 3rd of that year was a terrible tragedy. We lost two brothers in a car accident. And so my father withdrew from, from that scene uh, immediately. So that was the end of the mayoral aspirations. And as Michael was saying, back at the house, trying to figure his trajectory. Um, that was very close between Tip O'Neill and Hugh Carey as to who would be uh, sort of the heir apparent. The heir leadership. apparent. And there was a local congressman from Brooklyn who we won't name who switched his allegiance to Tip and so that kind of sealed it. The Tip was going to be in line for speaker. So what we're going to do when we go to part two, we're going to talk about how dad ran for, uh, for governor and we're going to also talk about his sons and the rest of the family to tell me more about the legacy. That's fine. It might be a minute or two for us because we can No, 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 no. <laughs> we're going to give you more than a minute or two. No, because, because it really dovetails with, you know, as, as his options to move up in the house, you know, uh, uh, closed, you know, it became a question of him getting out of the house altogether or going to another office. And that's the segue to governor. And that's for Break. part two. Stay tuned for the sequel. Thanks for being here today.